John, we've spoken before about how you felt this. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard had bastardized some of the techniques of Carl Jung, Freud, and even Alistair Crowley to a certain extent. Would you like to elaborate on that? Conclusively, I can't say yet. It's an ongoing thing for me. I, I, I'm, as I read more and as I make comparisons, I'm be, I begin to see bits and pieces of things, right? What I do know is that Scientology is, Hubbard admitted it in so many words, um, that it is that he stole, he borrowed from an awful lot of areas in order to create the system that is Scientology. Um, for instance, um, I think he plugged into the Jungian archetype in term, archetype in ter terms of like w when you're doing whole track auditing and you're seeing these things, you know, it's not an actual past life. It's, it's an expression of an internal landscape. And I look at all the landscapes I looked at and they were very alone and very empty landscapes. So I think that's very Jungian. But conclusively I can't say yet, but any in-depth research and there's plenty of scope for people to look at materials and compare and extrapolate. Mm -hmm. Just watch the language, the trouble is that Hubbard changed the language of everything to a very specific proprietary language that he used for so called Scientologies. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing that strikes me about Scientology is that uh, it seems to constantly use acronyms and abbreviations that seem totally unnecessary or this, uh, it, it uses um, it uses terms that are overly elaborate to describe actions or events that are much simpler than the name would imply. I think that's very crucial to Scientology. Look, the reason is, Hubbard knew that he couldn't isolate all Scientologists from the whole world all the time, right? And he knew that if you have people working in the business world, for instance, right, you know, they're going to be coming across terms and so on. So what he did was he invented, by inventing his own language, he protected, he, he insulated the Scientologists from being influenced by standard thought processes and uh, administrative procedures and philosophies and worldviews, you see. Because if a, if a businessman says, uses the word upstat, that's not upstat. You see, no one in the rest of the business world uses upstat. You know, they use the words like outcome and they use the word going forward and they use, you know, whatever, you know. But that Scientology businessman is then insulated from influence by the other world because he knows that doing things this way is upstat, you know, or doing that is out ethics. So yeah, it, it, it's part of a, it's part of a barrier, it's part of the invisible barrier that surrounds every Scientologist. Yeah. It's been argued that the Scientology uh, drug rehabilitation program, Narcanon, um, does actually work in terms of it does actually get people off drugs and away from their addictions. So is this, is that actually, is it actually a practical program and do, does it work for people? Yeah, so, Narcanon either, either, um, the person who does like take take the high profile ones like Kirstie Alley, okay? Um, she did Narcanon and ended up just doing Scientology. Now she's as nutty now as she ever was. I mean, really, you take a good look at Kirstie Alley. She's a quite far gone woman. Um, she's addicted to Scientology. She, uh, uh, someone who's who, who, who's a psychologist or a psychiatrist could probably look at her and, and, and look at all her actions and reactions and see that they are the actions and actions of a drug addict. She needs Scientology. She needs to be hooked to the e-meter. She needs this buzz of going forward and going into these other lifetimes. That's a drug trip. I mean, come on. Well, if that's not a drug trip, what is? I mean, you're seeing being on a spaceship and seeing, you know, the god Zenu looking at you. I mean, come on, that's the, you know. So um, there's something, something about Scientology was able to plug into the same place that drugs plug into. It's almost like the, there is, it, on a cellular level, there is this um, artificial um, substances that can plug in to say an area and it fits the socket, yeah. right? Um, and somehow Hubbard was able to artificially create this with a mixture of the e-meter and 
retrogression or whatever else, but he plugs into the bit of the person that needs drugs. Now, I, for instance, I can absolutely say without any doubt that I am an addictive type of person. I'm a person who is messed up enough that I would have been, if it wasn't Scientology, I might have been on heroin or something like that. No, I'm not saying it doesn't excuse Scientology as being Scientology any good at all. It's actually, rather than getting the right kind of intervention that I needed to deal with what I went through as a child, and this kind of push-pull thing like, when daddy's good, he's great, and it's all loving, and then when he's bad, and then, you know, the same as the drugs, the same as Scientology. Scientology does this to you all the time. Up, bam, up, bam, up, bam, you know? That's so totally, no, uh, uh, Narconon, all Narconon does, it introduces a person in a very intense way to the Scientology worldview, taking them off the intense up and down of drugs into the intense up and down of Scientology. That's all, it's just a transition bridge. And the guys that don't get into Scientology tend to go back on drugs again. That tends to be the case. The free personality test that uh, people are, are regularly offered outside churches of Scientology is actually called the Oxford Standard Capacity Analysis Test. I was wondering, why is it called that? Um, how many people actually would be rejected based on the test? And if so, why? Okay, um, it's, it is only called the Oxford Standard Capacity Analysis Test is to give it the to make it look academic and to make it look um, studied and tested and you know you know if it's it, it sounds safe doesn't it Oxford oh it's like the Oxford dictionary oh it's a good dictionary you know Oxford standing capacity or oh, it must be good so it's just a marketing trick that's all it is it doesn't mean anything to do with never done anything with Oxford I don't know what the exact percentages are but uh, an awful lot of people I mean. A lot of my family, people I know, uh, not my brothers and sisters, but other of the other end, the the, the broader family, um, you know, have popped into the Scientology Center or been tested, you know, and none of them have got him, you know, um, the the because there's a couple of things that happen. One, Scientology rejects the person. If the scores come out along the top or comes out in very good shape, yeah, the, the Scientology, we were trained to reject those people because they're completely, there's no, there's no um, hole in the armor. You can't get in there, you can't get a hook in on someone who's in good shape, who's like, fine, hey, things are grand, you know what I mean? And, and we'll give, so the, 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 the technical designation for such people is, a very uh, disparaging term, which is uh, thiti witi, you see, and thiti witi meaning that they're kind of they're up in their heads in the clouds, and the whole world is wonderful, you see. And Hubbard says no one's like that. Everybody's got seething pains and agonies crawling around in their heads, you see. So he called them thiti witi. Okay, um, not an awful lot of people who do the test just straight away. Most people, most rational, normal people would walk into a Scientology place, do a test and say, this is just kind of weird by. It's people, I suppose, of uh, the ilk of myself, I suppose, really, who are extremely vulnerable, get hooked in very quickly. Yeah, and especially in, in the orientation film, uh, the one that I saw anyway, yeah. that at, at the at the very end, it actually went so far as to, it was almost threatening me with uh, my own suicide. Well, exactly, yeah, yeah, he says it at the end, and it's, it's, it's the, we didn't like, look, we as staff members didn't like the orientation film. We actually didn't, because your guy's standing there, and he says, look, you're either going to do Scientology, or you can go home and blow your brains out. And that's a message from the Church of Scientology to a potential new recruit. Now, that tells you an awful lot just in itself, and that's the official... You have to watch that and sign a waiver. That's what's frightening about it, right? Um, we were not allowed to put people on a course unless you signed this waiver. And what the waiver essentially says is that anything that happens to you is of your own cognizance. So if you started Scientology and then jumped out a window, it's your cognizance. And you've signed that because you saw orientation and you've signed this, this waiver, it's about that long. Most people don't read it, they just uh, sign it, you know, it's, well, of course not, it's like, you know, if, you, if you're signing up for, say, some kind of a 
financed offer on a new mobile phone or a car or something. The small print is very, very small and difficult to read, right? So that's what Scientology does with this orientation thing. It's small print and it's a horrible thing to read. It's horrible. So yeah, yeah definitely the, the orientation is a, a frightening little mechanism, but it, but, but, it, but it essentially wavers. Scientology is wavered from any responsibility of what happens to you there.